like if, if people are really going to shell out a lot of money, they want to know they're talking to the best. And so this is where social proof becomes so huge. So I think for a lot of people, if you don't know what your 10 year goal is, let me suggest one for you. Become the most famous person in your industry. Now, you might think that the pandemic is the true cause of so many of us focusing on short-term issues and firefighting and being reactionary. But I have news for you. This challenge has been around for the years I've been advising chief marketing officers and CEOs. This problem has persisted and it only has been exacerbated by the pandemic. You know, in private, my CMOs will tell me, I just don't make time to design the future. I'm too busy handling the problems I inherited, or I'm too busy checking my inbox and going on the Slack channel and handling the day-to-day -day challenges or questions that pop up. Well, now is the time for us to talk about how we can play the long game and tackle the tough questions of what does it mean to play the long game? And how do we buck the trend in our society of focusing on short-term gains and short-term investment returns? We need to live in both worlds. And that's why I'm very excited today to be talking with Dory Clark. Now, I could spend a long time talking about my friendship with Dory and all of her great accomplishments, but I've narrowed it down to 10 descriptors. Friend, prodigy, author, stand-up comedian, Broadway investor, e-learning pioneer, avid New York fan and resident, activist, big thinker, and last but not least, a fellow cat lover and cat mom. So without further ado, I want you to know that this book, Dory's new book is very special. I think it's her best book yet to date. And we're very pleased to have her with us today on the Mindful Marketer live stream. Good afternoon, Dory. Lisa, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. Well, you know, being fellow cat moms, it's important that we uh, stay connected and share all of our great little stories. <laughs> Tell us about your two brothers, the two little brothers. Absolutely. This is this is always the best uh, the best question possible because who doesn't want to talk about cats? I have uh, two little guys that I adopted five years ago, Heath and Phil. Uh, Phil is a white and black cat that really, really wants to be famous. He loves to uh, to zoom bomb webinars and uh, just appreciates all the adoration. And uh, Heath is a really sweet little loving cat with perhaps some anxiety issues, and he prefers. A dark room. So they're, they're a great team. Oh my gosh. A little yin and yang. Absolutely. Dynamics there. You know, I bring that up because our pets are personal, right? I mean, we love them so much and they, they really have helped us through these difficult pandemic moments of isolation, which helps me transition to our discussion today about the book, the long game. Um, I've read all your books. You and I have been following each other for a long time and helped each other in so many ways. But to me, this book for you was much more personal than your other books. Um, tell us what inspired you to tell more of your own personal stories in this book, Dory. Well, one, you're, you're exactly right, Lisa. And one of the reasons that in the long game, it is a little bit more personal Actually, when I when I first started writing books, my first one was Reinventing You that came out now uh, eight years ago. I had trained as a journalist and something that I really wasn't even aware of. It, it was just, you know, so implicit. It was a blind spot was that as a journalist, you are trained not to put yourself in the story. You are the least interesting part of the story. You need to write about the things outside yourself. It's considered kind of, eh, you know, amateurish or self-aggrandizing to, uh, to be writing about yourself. And so I wrote Reinventing You 
like a journalist would. And I actually had my editor come back to me and say, basically, well, where, where are you in this? You know, you have some relationship to reinvention. Why don't you include yourself? And I, I was like, oh, that's a thing you want me to do that. And uh, then I, I realized, you know, from the feedback that I got from readers, like, oh, that's actually the part that people like best. So which was just bonkers to me. And so I really had to unlearn that over the course of my various books uh, and, and come to understand that people people really did want to hear your own journey. And so I, I think finally have become more comfortable doing that and talking about that. So I foregrounded it in some ways in the long game, uh, but that was really a process. I loved it. I, it just helped me see things about you that I already knew because, you know, we've had a lot of nice conversations and dinners and uh, shared a couple glasses of uh, adult beverages over the years. But this that really meant a lot to me to say, oh, my gosh, yeah, she finally starts to connect all of these disparate dots and shows us the richness of your life. And I'd like to ask you too. speaking of your life, um, talk to us about at what stage of your life? What was that life moment where you said, I got to do something different for the long game, for the long haul, because where I'm at isn't necessarily going to get me there? Yeah, well, I, I think that there are probably multiple inflection points for many people. And I'd be curious, of course, Lisa, to hear about yours as well. But for me, one thing that I can really point to when it comes specifically to the evolution of my business is that there came a certain point where I realized, you know, and this is maybe 20, 2010, 2011, that I was not going to be able to grow my business unless I, I really did something dramatically different. Because I think a, a realization that a, a lot of um, new entrepreneurs and small business people kind of never, you know, they, they either never reach it or they don't know what to do about it, which is like everybody else. I mean, I think every business owner starts out with the people that they know, and then the people that they know refer them to the other people that they know. That's fantastic. But I was, the people that I knew didn't have a lot of money. And that was actually a really big problem over time. I'm like, all right, this is great. But if I don't want to literally kill myself, I need to level up. I was working with lovely people and nice people, but I wanted to uh, be playing at a bigger level and making more money and working for organizations that were just operating on a broader scale. And I knew that there was just literally no way that I could continue doing that through referrals because people know people like themselves. And I, I realized I had to just sort of inject something different. I had to kind of put a screw in the works to, to turn it uh, into something different. And so that is why I really began to double down on my efforts in writing. And, you know, this is a, a process that I talk about a lot in my various books, especially my book, Stand Out. Uh, I made a very conscious decision around 2011 that I would actually start cutting back on the work that I was doing. I would weed out lower paying clients and redirect my time and effort to writing and to grow to specifically kind of growing my platform. And it actually meant that for a period of three years, my income decreased, you know, by, by six figures. Uh, I was I was making quite a bit less money uh, because I was allocating so much time to platform building, but I was doing it with a strategic intention. And that intention was platform building, which I which I wagered, I didn't know it really was a bet, but I wagered that that would help me over the long term be able to grow my business and, and raise my fees um, in, in a way that would make it worth it. And fortunately, that did happen. Uh, but, you know, for like a three year period, that's it's uh, an intense bet to make. Oh, it definitely is an intense bet. I recently did something very similar. I had I have a, a great marketing coach Act, and of course, have worked with some of the legends like Alan Weiss. And of course, we get to participate regularly in the 100 Coaches community where there are some prolific authors and experts and consultants. Um, but I recently did something very similar as I, I released one of the offerings that I had because the margins were really low and were not reaping recurring dividends. And I said, I'm going to double down on what we can do with CMOs and my online learning. 
and my live streams. And it real it created a double digit hit and increase in my revenues right away. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's it, not easy. It does it does really take a, a leap of faith to do it. But but all of these things are, are calculated bets. You know, you you just say, all right, I, I need to do something different. Let's let's experiment. Let's put out a hypothesis and see how it goes. So props to you for doing that, Lisa. Yes. Well, and it also takes and uh, some advice for all of you watching. It's not easy to do this. The one thing that gave me the courage to do it is I know what kind of and what level of risk I'm willing to take. And I create both mental reserves and financial reserves before I do that. And I, I think that every one of us needs to define what is prudent risk to us. And for me, it's 12 months of cash. You know, it's, it's tw that's my number. So that's, and everyone's got to pick their number, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm, a, I'm right there with you. Being self-employed, I think that it's actually really important to disproportionately prioritize having a stash of liquid assets, because essentially that means that you are, uh, th th that you are not going to fall prey to the vicissitudes of timing, right? I mean, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of risk that you can withstand if you have cash in the bank because you never have to fold. You never have to get desperate. You can wait for the market to turn. However, we're defining the market and there's a lot of power in that. A question that came in from a client, Sarah Briegel, who's joining us from Massachusetts, Dory. Let's see what she has to ask. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Dory. Uh, thank you for, for hosting today's session. It is, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to hear this dialogue. So Dory, um, a question for you. I work for a company called Linkage. We help leaders uh, become better people managers. And right now um, we're hearing and seeing a lot of leaders struggle with how do we get through this time of uncertainty, obviously with COVID and now with the Delta variant being a very real reality. How do you, how do you help people leaders prioritize this long-term thinking in a world where we are faced with uncertainty and, and constant change due to COVID. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Sarah. That's uh, that's obviously the the kind of big picture question that's on everybody's mind these days, right? And I was in the thick of it because as literally the day so the, the day that I got the uh, acceptance for my book from Harvard Business Review Press, it was February 28th, 2020, literally the next morning, the first COVID case uh, was revealed in New York, March 1st. And within two weeks, pretty much the entire nation was shut down. So things moved fast. And that was a time, you know, over that first year, let's say of COVID, when I feel like the scales were tipped in you know, very far in the opposite direction of nimbleness, agility, responsiveness. And we have to do that sometimes, right? That those, those are undoubtedly important skills and important things that we need to be able to do. No question. But also what I am very committed to, and part of why I, I at least like to think that long-term thinking and the long game is still relevant at the end of this is you also sim similarly can't do responsiveness and reactivity and agility all the time. That can't be your only trick because if that's our only trick, it means we don't have an agenda of our own. And I, I am personally, I am done with COVID bossing me around. COVID is not going to be the boss of me anymore. I know that, yeah, that's right. Take that COVID. If you're watching, take that. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I mean, do we have to be nimble and responsive? Yes. I mean, I'm getting notices, you know, I, I was going to be speaking at a couple of conferences this fall. Now it's like, I don't know, you know, like maybe, maybe it's virtual. Like there's things that we might have to pivot. There's things we might have to change. And we get that. But we also, if we're going to ever take back control so that we are able to call our pitch and move in the right direction, we have to nonetheless be long-term thinkers. Now, what does that mean? Part of the reason that I actually like really long-term thinking, like let's call it 10 plus years, this is my favorite part. Here's my secret. When you are planning for the long-term, let's say 10 plus years, you don't have to know how you're going to do it. 
amazing. <laughs> we get so like caught up about like, oh my God, well, how are you going to do the plan? Blah, 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 blah. It's 10 years away. You don't need to know. You just need to know the next thing. And you keep doing the next thing, the next thing. You'll figure it out. I promise you when you're five years in, you're going to know a lot more about how you're going to achieve that 10-year plan. So it's both and. And I love that question. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, Story. It's great to see you, Sarah. Thanks for being Likewise. here. Thanks for by the way, stay on everyone because we will be sharing some special links at the end where you can download some very outstanding gifts from Dory for the long game. And uh, your assessment's really amazing and rock solid. So we'd like to um, now bring on another guest who has a question for you, Dory, and for me. And let's welcome Aviva. Hey, Aviva. Hey, good to see you. So thanks thanks so much for having me on the show. Um, my name is Aviva Leggett. I'm the author of Get Real and Get In with St. Martin's Press, which I was fortunate enough to interview Dory for. Um, check it out, it's about college admissions. And I wanted to ask a question. Um, this topic is interesting to me because my industry is very much changing. You know, the college admissions landscape has really become a lot more competitive. You know, the schools that people thought they could get into, really, they don't stand a chance at. And so, you know, a lot of people in my field, myself included, are thinking about, well, how do we um, pivot or position ourselves right in the short term? Um, and so in that sort of momentum where you're trying to change and change and change, what does it look like to, you know, what does that 10 year goal look like at this point for someone like me who's in an industry that's very much in upheaval and in change right now? I, I think that's such such a great question, such an astute question, Aviva, because it's true. Uh, cert certainly college admissions is a prime example, but there are lots of industries where there are dramatic changes going on. And so a logical question is, how do you even come up with a 10 year plan when the world could be so different? The landscapes could be so different. We, we don't even know what to plan for. And so I will say that in so first of all, um, I think that if you have some kind of a vision, uh, even, even if it seems kind of, you know, bold and extreme, that one point that I make in the long game is that a lot of people actually just temper their, their, uh, expectations or their goals way too much. You know, they're sort of like, Oh, maybe I can be a VP. And it's like, you know what, if it's your 10 year goal, make it the CEO. Why not? Because again, you don't have to know how to get there. And so if you have a world domination goal for 10 years, I would say, put it on there. That's fantastic. Like we can go for it. But here, here's the, the key that I would say. If so in college admissions in particular, this is very much uh, echoing a lot of trends that we're seeing in a lot of industries, which is that the, the, T the trend over time to a kind of winner take all is really uh, taking place here. So we know that, you know, there's probably always going to be community colleges. There's probably always going to be Ivy League and like elite colleges. And the middle is going to get sucked out. A lot of them are going to go out of business. That actually makes you as a college admissions expert that much more valuable because it becomes that much more valuable to be going to Harvard and not to the community college. And so the need for your services is going to be huge. Now, when I say your, I mean the services of a college admissions person, but the same thing that's happening in higher ed overall is happening in the world of college admissions experts because they want to know, like if, if people are really going to shell out a lot of money, they want to know they're talking to the best. And so this is where social proof becomes so huge. So I think for a lot of people, if you don't know what your 10 year goal is, let me suggest one for you. Become the most famous person in your industry. That is a darn good 10 year goal. And so accruing as much social proof as possible is a fantastic thing to do. And Aviva, I know you are well on your path. You've written a, a book from a prestigious commercial publisher, St. Martin's Press. You write for Forbes. You've been quoted in a lot of national publications. Those are the exact right moves and the things you need to do. You need third party validation of things that people have heard of, media outlets, et cetera, that people have heard of saying, this lady's legit. And when we accrue enough of that, that means that as the market gets cleared out, you become one of the people who are the disproportionate 80-20 winners. And that's what I want for you. And that's what I want for everybody on this call. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aviva. I feel like we need to send you one of those minister robes. I know, you know you've studied theology extensively in your life and 
but there is there is a certain religiosity religiosity to what you're saying and i am also super religious about never stopping to create valuable content insights and connections um what makes me the saddest story is when i run across amazing thought leaders and you know thank you aviva for being one of the thought leaders here today who say to me and i'm not making this up lisa i don't know about this live streaming thing i don't know about this podcasting thing i did six podcasts yeah didn't do much for me i don't do it anymore and i i really get sad when i hear that and i hear that from big organizations and i hear it from solopreneurs so, What's your perspective on that? Well, I feel I feel sad. So let's parse sad because I feel sad as well, like for them. But I actually, a part of me feels happy, Lisa, and it feels happy because it it's about what I want to see rewarded is the people who are willing to do the work, and so it's the people who are pushing on. And who are saying, you know what? I did six episodes. I'm not seeing any traction. I'm not seeing any pickup. I'm going to keep going. Those are the people that I want the universe to be rewarding. I don't want people who, you know, with this short term mentality to be like, you know, like, oh, thriving and succeeding. Right. I mean, I'm just like, what can I say? I'm too Calvinist for that. Whatevs, you know, like I want the hard work to be rewarded. And so when somebody says, oh, I tried it and, you know, two times later they give up, I'm like, Okay, good, because it clears the path for the people who are willing to persevere. And those are the people that I admire. And to your point, this is this is super common. In my book, Entrepreneurial You, I actually quote a super interesting longitudinal study that was done over a 10-year period by a guy named Josh Marshall, who was a researcher, and he studied all the podcasts in the iTunes store. And he discovered that the average podcast lasted only 12 episodes and six months. So basically two episodes a month for six months before it was shut down. That was the average. And it's like, oh my God. So if you keep pushing past it, which I know you have, you're close to 50 episodes with this, which is amazing. You know, that that's really the behavior where you're able to just push, push and keep going. And over time, you are going to outlast a vast majority. I mean, do you need to be good? Yeah, of course you need to be good. But also, you get better over time. And with that time and that practice and that, uh, that you know, just sort of momentum that comes with keeping on doing things, you really can achieve big success, which I think in many ways is the entire premise of the long game. So I'm right there with you. Yes. I love what you said on page 180 of your book when you said, quote, you have to be excellent and you have to be at bats. I mean, you need at bats. So every week, whether I like it or not, what do I do? I reach out to chief marketing officers. I follow up with chief marketing officers. I check in with them on LinkedIn chats. I send good content that is you know, tied directly to some of the business imperatives that they're facing at that moment. I don't stop. And persistence pays off. You know, there's there's no downside. There's, no, I mean, absolutely no downside. So I wanna talk to you about your mentors and supporters who help you keep going. Could you share with us a couple of your mentors who play the long game brilliantly? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that you know, there's there's a lot of great people that I learned from. I mean, one just to just to cite a common example we have, as uh, as you saw, Lisa, because I know you've uh, you've read the long game. Uh, someone that I profile in the book is our friend Marshall Goldsmith, and something that that I really love about him and his approach. Um, so there's a concept that I talk about in the long game called thinking in waves, and the basic premise of this uh, this is about career waves. And uh, a point that I make is that I feel like where a lot of people, a lot of good, smart, talented people go wrong in their careers is that, you know, they sometimes they come to me and they're like, I'm, I'm working so hard and I'm, do, I'm doing the things and it's not working. Why is it not working? And so you dig into it a little bit. And what you discover is that they they just keep doing the same thing. 
And the, the, the trick in careers, that whole thing about careers, is that you have to do different things. And you have to shift sometimes. You can't just keep doing the same thing. You have to make transitions and think in waves. And different waves are appropriate at different times. And so in Marshall's case, I talk about you know, when you get to the point of success that he's at, right, he's in his early 70s, he's written extremely popular books, he's, you know, by now very successful, very wealthy, he's sort of reached the place where a lot of people would take their their foot off the gas and just say, all right, now I'll bask. <laughs> and, you know, on one hand, you can understand that. And on the other hand, as Marshall says, you really can't go from being CEO one day to eating chicken salad sandwich at the club the next day and be happy about that. Like it's, it's just, if that's the rest of your life and that's never going to change, that's a little depressing. And so he, I think really is a great exemplar of the fact that when you're in the reaping phase, yeah, reap, enjoy it, but that can't be your whole life. And you need to reshift back into the first stage, quote unquote, which is the learning phase and learning about something different. And Marshall has done that by creating his 100 coaches program, uh, where he's passing on his knowledge and creating a, a kind of learning community. And he learns through that process as well. And I think that that's a, a great way to keep in mind and, and a way for all of us to keep ourselves fresh is to recognize you have to keep changing your tactics. You have to keep moving forward and you can't just, you know, sit there, uh, in one mode and, uh, you know, throw your fist at the sky. Yes. And please do not rest on your laurels of what you accomplished 10 years ago. I remember in my previous life, before I started my business 20 years ago, I was part of an, a group of sales training faculty members. And we were all in Mexico City, Dory, and we were training IBM. And one of the instructors was a very seasoned uh, former executive from Digital Equipment Corporation may they rest in peace. And he spent the whole time when he was teaching the concepts behind these sales methodology, talking about the good old days. Oh, wait, you know, 20 years ago when I worked at digital equipment and the examples were just not relevant anymore. And what Marshall does so brilliantly and what you do so brilliant, brilliantly is you share examples that are contemporary and you share examples that come out of nowhere, like when you chipped your tooth or when you learn stand-up comedy. And you would say, wait a minute, stand-up comedy? What's that got to do with becoming a thought leader and building a successful business? A lot, a lot. So um, that's what I love about you is you just always reinventing and trying uh, something else quickly I wanna talk about that I should also uh, talk about with my clients is this whole concept of minimum viable product and this mindset of experimentation. So that's also been very helpful for you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, minimum viable product is a concept that folks in Silicon Valley have been talking about for a long time. It's sort of a, a key component of the so-called lean startup methodology, which was popularized about a decade ago um, by Steve Blank and by Eric Ries in his book, The Lean Startup. Um, but one of the, the points that I try to make in the long game is that there are a lot of interesting business techniques that many of us, in fact, may apply in our professional lives but we should be applying them in our personal life as well. These are really useful concepts. And the thing that I like about you know, a minimum viable product, I mean, the, bas the basic way to describe it is don't spend like millions of hours making this perfect, pretty, amazing thing before finding out, does anybody want it in the first place? And that's good advice. And it's also good advice for us in our own lives to understand that it's okay to test little things. Like if you're, for instance, thinking about making a career switch, I mean, my God, don't just like quit your job and plunge into something. That's not really a good idea. That sounds a little overly risky to me. Instead, you know, have the informational interviews, t you know, take a week off and job shadow someone, uh, you know, learn something, do an internship, you know, try, try something nights and weekends, test it out to make sure if you actually do like it, test it out to make sure it, people actually want the thing that you want to be providing them. And then when you have that data, it's not, it's not so risky. In fact, it may not even be risky at all because you have enough data to know with some degree of certainty whether something is going to work or not. And it doesn't have to be a roll of the dice. 
Absolutely not. Uh, that's something that even some of my larger corporate clients struggle with. It can especially be challenging if you work for, many of you here work for organizations where they have a long history of tradition of how they do business and their product launches can take two to three years. Well, I don't know about you, Dory, but not too many competitive organizations now can afford to sit, spend three years testing out an idea. So it's got to be quick and find that subset of customers or prospects where you can see what the uh, receptivity is to those particular ideas. To keep going is a great piece of advice. How do you prevent burnout when you are testing and learning and uh, planting so many seeds? Yeah. And of course, this, this is crucial. Keeping going, you need to do it. Um, but to the point about career waves and thinking in waves, one one other aspect of this is that you know the answer to marathon or sprint is both, but we have to alternate, right? There are times, and in fact, I am keenly aware of this right now because I am in the middle of a book launch for the long game. This the long game is coming out September twenty first, so uh, mark mark your calendars. It's uh, it is available for pre sale now if you are excited about that. Um, but you know, for the next six weeks, I'm a maniac. I'm I'm <laughs> doing like all these interviews, writing all these things. It is pretty relentless. I also realize, you know, number one. This is what I need to do. This is what I need to do at this time in order to make the launch successful. I do not want to have the launch and then at the end of it be like, gosh, I guess I, I should have worked a little harder. Like, right? Nobody wants to regret something. So I have to do that, even if it's a little miserable. However, I also am not going to, you know, would it be optimal for sales of the book for me to market like a maniac for the rest of my life? I mean, yes, I'd probably sell more books if I did that. I also can't sustain it. And so I am making choices about how, how to throttle up and how to throttle down. And so once the launch period is over, I am not going to stop promoting the book. That would be a mistake, but I am going to ratchet it down so that it becomes manageable. And I'm going to continue that through the end of the year. And... Uh, starting in January and February, I'm actually planning to take two months of, a, I'll call it a quasi sabbatical, where I am, I'm not eliminating all my professional activities, but I am probably eliminating 90% of them so that I can just take a break because these have been a very, very busy last couple of years. Um, you know, COVID uh, to the point of the conversation with Aviva, uh, a lot of things are, have become wildly unequal just in, in terms of, of these. Um, kind of power law properties. And so some, some people, uh, unfortunately during COVID, you know, they lost their job, they lost all their work, you know, other people, and, and I would be in this category and I do feel grateful. It's a good problem to have, but, but I got way too much work. And so it's like, it's like none of the work, all of the work. And so it's been a crazy two years. And so I am therefore going to turn the dial down dramatically for a couple of months to reset and then, you know, get it, get it back to a more normal pace. Uh, so I think, I think when we talk about how to avoid burnout, it's understanding that we, we will need to learn to toggle between the sprint mode and the marathon mode. Definitely. And kudos to you. You take most Fridays off. I take most Fridays off on, and only focus on my live stream. I don't do meetings. I don't fill it up. Um, and it just does help restore my energy and get me ready for the following week. So we're wrapping up, Dory. I wish we had more time together, but we're going to have you back for sure, and continue to celebrate your success and the contribution you're making to the world because you are such a special person in my life and you teach us and model what it means to truly be a mindful marketer. Uh, Lisa, so, thank you so much. It's so great to, to be here and have the chance to talk with you and your wonderful audience. And I'll just mention for folks that are interested in learning more about strategic thinking and long-term planning, uh, I have a free resource that if in case it might be of interest. It is uh, the long game self-assessment, the strategic thinking self-assessment. And anyone who'd like can get it for free at doryclark.com slash the long game. Uh, yes, and we put it up there as a banner so people can watch the live stream replay and make sure you get that assessment and order her book. Pre-order it. It's on Amazon and other fine booksellers. Dory, happy weekend. Best to you and your cats. And we will see you again soon. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thanks, everyone.